Hi there and welcome back. We're in the middle of a heat wave here on the shores of the Bristol Channel. It's absolutely boiling at the moment. I say that there's a bit of a sea breeze just picking up just to take the edge off of things. But over the next couple of days, it's set to exceed 30 degrees and that's going to be quite something. I'm concentrating my efforts over low water, which is around two o'clock. I'm going to aim to be fishing for about an hour and a half before low water and then perhaps fish about three or four hours of the flooding tide. But the main thing today is I'm going to be going through absolutely everything that I'm doing in regards to rigs, rods, reels and everything else so you've got a really good idea of what to expect when you come down to yourself. Anyway that's enough of me wafting on, let's go and do some fishing. Well, I've just got down on the mark, and as I said earlier, it is absolutely blowing a hooli today. Well, initially I suspected there was a bit of a sea breeze, but it's more than that. It really is coming along the front here. Could make things a little bit uncomfortable, but at least it's taking the edge off of the temperature. Right, the main point of today, as I've said, is to go through absolutely every element of my fishing, how I go about things, why I do what I do, the tackle that I use, rods, reels, rigs, leads, all the other little bits and pieces that go together. I'm going to talk you through my entire approach so that hopefully when you guys come to fish the Bristol Channel, you'll have a fighting chance too. The first thing we need to do is get the tripod set up correctly so it's not going to get blown over. And what I always say to people is keep your tripod down nice and low and preferably have it placed so that the wind is on your back so when you're looking at the rod tips you're not getting blown all over the place. So the tripod is the first thing to go up regardless of anything else and because I've got that side wind I'm just going to put the tripod almost totally sideways on and obviously when you're fishing somewhere like this it's quite a smooth surface so you want to find something that your your tripod legs are really going to dig into now when it comes to rods you want something that's powerful enough to be able to fish effectively now by that i mean you want something that's going to cast six or maybe seven ounces of lead sometimes you don't want it too powerful if the rod is too powerful you won't be able to compress it you won't be able to cast any distance but what's important is having that power in the rod so that when you're pulling for a break, when you're trying to pull a lead from the bottom, when you're trying to pull a fish back through the tide, there could be a load of weed on there as well. You don't want a rod that's just going to fold over on the tip. You want something that's got a bit of steel to it. So it really is that compromise. You want something that you can cast efficiently, but you want something that's strong enough to do the job in hand. So that's the tripod in position. I've just got to get comfortable now. I've moved my box round. I can see my rod tips absolutely fine. I've got that wind coming along the side, but that's going to be on my back. I've got my cool box to my left-hand side so I can prepare my baits on my other traces absolutely fine too. So with all of that set up, what's next? Reels. Now, when it comes to reels, I like to use multiplier reels. There's nothing wrong whatsoever with modern day fixed spool reels. They're really efficient. They cast well, they've got good gearing. There's no reason at all not to use a fixed spool. A multiplier is just my preference. Now, this is a, a 20 size reel. And this goes back to Daiwa multiplier reels, originally being referred to as 20s or 30s or 40s, and there was even a 50 at one time. Now, those larger models, you'll rarely see them nowadays, and there's not really any great need for them here in the UK. So most anglers will be using either a 20 or a 30 size model. Now, for the Bristol Channel, certainly for the upper reaches, a 20 is absolutely fine. This, this is a uh, Soltiga 20. It's got a mono mag conversion. They do come centrifugally braked as standard, but a lot of people do like to put the magnetic conversion on there. It just means that on the day, you can suit the braking of the reel to suit the conditions. This one's loaded up with 20 pounds or 0.40 millimeter Varivas yellow sport line. And on there, 
there's an Ultima shock leader. Uh, the shock leader's about £80, I believe. So that one's loaded up. A lot of guys I take out fishing, they come along with a multiplier and it is grossly underfilled. And I mean, there's half a spool of line on there. So what's that gonna do? That's gonna cut back your casting distance, not just because it's only got a certain amount of line on it, but what happens is when you cast, the line level drops very quickly, okay? So we've got that filled to the gunnels. There's enough room to obviously tie the shock leader on and that one's good to go. So I said I'm gonna keep it simple. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. Now, I've loosened off the clutch on the reel, I've flicked the ratchet over, and this just enables me to pull the line off of the reel without pulling off so much that it potentially causes an overrun before we've even cast out. It's just a nice little visual indicator, sorry, audible, I should say, indicator, that the line is coming off of the reel. Yeah, I'm just gonna thread that through there, like that. Now, what a lot of people don't do and what you seriously do need to be doing, once you've tied your shock leader onto the reel, add a quick release clip. This enables you to put a rig on there straight away, saves tire knots on the beach because that's a time consuming thing that you can do at home, and make the most of your time fishing. So you've got comfortable, you've got your tripod up, you've made your rods up, your reels are on there. We've discussed line and shock leader. Next thing I like to do is clip on a lead. Once you've clipped on your lead, just give it a few little flicks just to wet the line. If you've got new line on your reel, this is especially important. Dry monofilament is horrible to cast with anyway. If you've got old line on your reel, chances are you might have packed up late on your last session and you left a bit of weed on the lead or not, or something like that. So we're just gonna make sure that everything is running as it should be. Let's just stick this one out there. Now, we're not tournament casting, okay? So, just gonna give it a little flick. And as I say, the purpose of this is just to make sure that the line is level on the reel, the line is wet, the reel is running correctly. You don't wanna be casting with a beautifully baited up brand new rig, which probably costs you a couple of quid and see the whole thing come apart in mid-air. So that was my gentle cast. I'll now give a slightly more powerful cast and I'm just gonna swing the lead out to the side. My simple fishing cast. Just like that. That means I'm further down the spool of line now. And I like to just get it all as wet as possible, let the line sink down. Obviously, if you've got very snaggy ground in front of you, you, you want to be careful doing that. You don't want the line to get trapped under the rocks. That'll do for that one. Get it all back on the reel as neatly as possible. And the bonus of doing this is that you'll also find out which way the tide is running. Now, I know from experience that on the ebbing tide on this mark, the tide's running right to left. But if you came here for the first time and you, you weren't too sure of that, cast out a plain lead, note where it lands on the water and where you retrieve it from. And that'll give you an idea. That's great. So the next part of the fish catching recipe, rigs. Now then, rigs. In recent years, those EVA foam winders have found favour with a lot of anglers who like to wind their, their traces, wrap their rigs around them and store them in a box. Now, personally for me, I've never found anything wrong whatsoever with the traditional rig wallet. This one here is labelled up, as you can see, so I know exactly what's in there. And if you have two or three of these, you can pick the right one for on the day to suit the conditions. Let's get into it and see what we've got inside there. So if I said to you the words pulley rig, you'd think, yeah, we've all heard of that before. Everyone uses it, what's the big deal? Well, no, it's not a particularly big deal, but it is the most effective rig for general shore fishing here in the Bristol Channel. So I'm gonna talk you through this variation that I've got here. 
six ounce lead, obviously wired to hold out in the tide. These are only 18 gauge wires, so a little bit flimsy, but I'm not expecting a lot of tide today. If I was, I'd switch it up and I'd have 16 gauge on there. 16 gauge wire is thicker, it's stronger, it holds in the bottom a lot more. In fact, you can really get those wires to, to wedge into the lead so it doesn't break out at all if you want. Tied onto there, a short length of 18 pound monofilament. Now remember, on the reels we're using 20 pounds, so this is a bit weaker. Theoretically, if the lead does become snagged, only that will snap. I'll come back to that though. So there we've got the bait clip, the Gemini Splashdown Solo clip, fantastic bait clip. I use these for absolutely everything now. They never come unclipped until you actually want them to, and that's the important bit. So onto the rig body itself. 100 pounds mono down to a bead, a swivel trapped between two beads in fact, and then a crimp. So a lot of people would use a swivel on there. In my opinion, it's something else to get snagged up. It's an unnecessary bit of kit that could get lost. So there you go. You can see that's how the pulley works. I'm pulling on the trace line. It's lifting the lead up off the ground. So in theory, when you hook a fish, it's gonna be out the back as it's coming in. The lead is gonna be closer towards you. But most importantly, the lead's going to be up in the water. It's gonna be away from the snags. And if it did get snagged, you've got that rotten bottom on there as well. So that's that. Like I say, 100 pound all the way through, stopped off by the crimp. And if we make our way down to the hooks, this is a rig that I'm using for smooth hounds, so I haven't gone too massive on the hooks. Basically, my lead hook there is a 2-0. That's a 2-0 Varivas Big Mouth Extra. Fantastic hooks, made in Japan. Does what it says on the tin, catches fish. Damn sharp, never have any issues. The top hook, a Varivas Chinu hook. Again, made in Japan. Fantastic hook that I've been using for a lot of years now. Caught me a lot of fish. Never had an issue with that one either. The important thing with this trace, if you take a look, that top hook is actually snelled in place. Okay, now by that I mean I've used a knotless knot, which is akin to carp fishing. It's how anglers tie their hair rigs for their boilies. We won't get into that though. And the snell on there locks it in place. And this is really important because if a fish grabs hold of that top hook, as they often do, it's not going to just slide down. There will be immediate resistance, which should, in theory, result in a hookup. On there, I'm going to be using crab or prawn possibly some squid but we'll get to the baits in a little bit that's my first rig of the day to go on one of those two rods i've already shown you so on to rig number two then this isn't a rig i use that often on these kind of marks but occasionally it's nice just to mix it up a bit and try something a bit different this rig is known as a two hook clips down so i'll start with the bottom of the rig and the lead now, we've got a six ounce lead on here as well. I'm using six ounces of lead today. It's not a big deal. I could probably get away with a five if I really wanted to. But as that bit of side wind, a six ounce could make the difference. Just get a, a few extra yards, perhaps. So for casting purposes, the little clip on the bottom of the solo clip, exactly the same as on the pulley rig. That lead just sits on there. So I can cast that with some force. It's not gonna snap. Upon impact with the seabed, that clip releases, leaving the weak link to do its stuff. So, moving away from that, we're familiar with that part now. With this rig, I've got two hooks, okay? There's the top of the rig. There's the bait clip at the bottom. And this top hook clips into what we call a cascade swivel, which is right here. And then, surprise, surprise, the bottom hook, I've actually done this the wrong way around, but you get the idea. The bottom hook goes into that bait clip. So if I show you how to do that properly, bottom hook in the solo clip, top hook into the cascade, which forms the bottom trace line. 
So that's what you're going to end up with. That's the rig clipped down and almost ready to go, other than the fact that the lead itself isn't clipped onto the rotten bottom clip. We won't worry about that right now. So what's going to happen? Water pressure pushes up the disc on the splashdown solo clip, releases that hook and cascade, cascading effect, releases that top hook. So there you go, two really effective rigs for fishing on these kind of marks. What's next? Bait. Okay, so bait. The first consideration before anything else is how are you going to look after that bait when you're actually fishing. Now if you go ramming it all into a carrier bag and stuff it into your rucksack, you're going to get to the mark, it's going to be defrosted, your live bait's going to be half dead, it's not a great start to the session. Get yourself a cool box or a cool bag, they range in price from about five quid up to ridiculous money, but it really is the foolproof way to take care of your bait. It's insulated, stick some ice packs in there and you're good to go. So when it comes to an average reef session in the summertime, I like to take a variety of baits with me and try a few different things on the day. Now, I'd never be without squid. Squid is a fantastic bait for rays. You can pick up the smooth hounds on it. You'll get congas, bass, it really is such a versatile bait. It's pretty cheap as well, about three quid a pack. That's an ammo one. Now, I've been using ammo frozen baits for a long, long time. They've been around since day dot and they really know how to look after their bait. It's the one brand I trust. Now, this isn't an advert for ammo or anyone else for that matter. I'm just telling you factually what I believe in. So that's that. Secondly, frozen peeler crabs. Now, these have been vacuum packed by a local shop, in fact, I will name them, it was real fun fishing in Porter said. I like to use all of the local fishing tackle shops from time to time, support them all. I don't favour one in particular. On this occasion, I popped into real fun and they had just what I was looking for. So got some nice freshly frozen crabs there. And finally, I've got a few prawns. Now these have been dynamite the last few years, fantastic for catching smooth hounds, but you'll also catch other species on them too. In fact, everything else that I've mentioned, rays, congas, dogfish, bass, all of that kind of stuff, they love the prawns too. I've also got in the cool box half a pound of prime dug ragworm. Now, I'm not going to get that out just yet because I don't want it to spoil in the sunshine, but I will show you it in just a moment. Let's get it on the hooks. Now, regardless of what baits you are going to be using on the day, what makes things a hell of a lot easier is having the correct tools to hand. So, sharp pair of scissors, bait elastic, you can get this in different grades. This is a medium because it suits all of the baits we've talked about so far. A bait needle, really good for putting on worm baits. If you haven't tried one already, like I say, they've been around since day dot two and they are fantastic. And then we've got a bait tool. This one's looking a little bit worse for wear, but it still works absolutely fine. And I'm gonna talk you through how I use these tools. So what I like to do with my peeler crabs is grab the crab and just cut kind of a third of the way through the back, like that. Give the crab a little squeeze, open it out ever so slightly and all you need to do is hold it alongside the hook. So I've opened out the crab and I'm nicking it through. And then I'm just going to hold it alongside the hook like that. Really, really simple. I'm going to take my bait tool. Now the bait tool is like a, a second pair of hands really. And I'm just going to hold the bait onto the bait tool like that. And I'm just going to start lashing that around the crab and around the bait tool all at once. There we go. That's looking good. And don't be shy with the elastic. Don't go crazy. But that is pretty much perfect. And you're left with something that looks like that. So what I'm going to do now is just pop the bait tool out. And there is our little crab bait. You don't need a massive bait for smooth hounds. This is another thing. They might be quite big fish, but you do not need a big bait. Single, sort of medium-sized crab, 
whip to those hooks. This is on the pulley rig, absolutely perfect. No matter what else happens, always take a towel with you. Getting all of that horrible, crappy stuff off your hands, it makes it a lot easier casting. You go and get a handful of slime and you try and cast a multiplier reel, what's gonna happen? Your thumb's gonna slip, bang, you're gonna lose the whole lot. So that's the first rig baited up and I'm itching to get a bait in the water. I'll get this one out there now and then I'll show you just how I go about setting up with the ragworm. Nice simple cast, we're not tournament casting. Can't do that anyway in all honesty. So I'm just going to swing the lead to the side, back the other way, nice and slow. Just a nice easy fishing cast and that wind's cut. I wasn't expecting it, I've got to be honest, I thought there'd be a little bit of a sea breeze but it is blowing its nuts off. There we go. I've also moved the tripod down a little bit close to the water because since I've been chatting to you, the water's disappearing. Here we go. Okay, so that's one rig out there. Let's get the other one baited up. I'll show you how to go about doing that one now. So when it comes to ragworm, a baiting needle is absolutely essential for really small hooks. Anything, say, below a size one, above that you can pretty much get away with just threading the worms on by hands, but get any smaller than a size one and it is really useful to have a baking needle to hand. Quite big worms today. I'm just going to get a worm, I'm going to go through the tail and I'm just going to thread the baiting needle all the way through the worm without trying to break the sides of it and all that bait needles come straight out through the mouth just like that and then all I'm going to do is take my hook and I'm going to pop the hook into the end of the baiting needle you see that and then I'm just going to slide that worm onto the hook snood so simple takes a bit of practice but you will get it it's quite easy so same again find a nice sized worm and I'm going to go through the tail not the head as a lot of people would because flatfish do actually take a ragworm head first so I've actually snapped that one a little bit overexcited, always oh, having a bite as well. There we go, out through the mouth. Now where it snaps off, I'm just going to pull that away. I don't really want that on there. So same thing again. I've got my small hook. The point of the hook goes into the end of the baiting needle. And I'm just going to slide that worm on like that. Pull the bait stop down, lock it in place. And that is how you bait up with ragworm. So I was just starting to think about baiting up another trait and the left hand rod, there's something going on with it. The tip's pulling over ever so slightly, then coming back up. Now, I don't know if it's weed. There could be a little bit of bank today because it is quite blustery and it, it does tend to stir the weed up a bit when there's a chop on the water. I think I'll keep an eye on that for a minute and uh, get another trace baited up. So I gave this one another five minutes or so. And I think it's time to change it now anyway. I can see a bit of weed on the line out there. So that's probably what was causing that sort of rise and fall of the tip. Let's grab this one in anyway. There we go. Quite often, if you're, if you're using good leads, it does take quite a bit to pull them out of the bottom. And that's not necessarily because it's really snaggy out there, it's just that the lead has got a good hold. So I can see there's a fair old bit of weed coming up the line here. 
it's not that nasty fibrous stuff that, that you often pick up though it's it's just regular weed that's floating on the surface so it won't cause us too many worries a little bit on the shock leader knot as well so we'll get that off I, I always say this I know but it's it's really important not to have anything that could potentially foul the guides as you're casting you know if that happens best case scenario it's going to cut your casting distance down worst case scenario it's going to cause a crack off but there we go you can see that bait hasn't really been touched and what's also interesting if we have a look you can see that the lead has remained on the clip now the reason for that as the lead touches down on the bottom if it's a particularly soft seabed it cushions the impact it doesn't cause that jump which makes the lead fall off anyway let's get the next one on there and sling it back out so bait number two is ready to go and I've opted for a bit of prawn this time and I've baited that up in exactly the way, same way that I showed you how I baited up the, the crab just now literally lay it alongside the bait tool whip it on with elastic and you're good to go now this one's trimmed down a bit if you use a whole prawn because of the shape of the prawn it's a bit like a banana it doesn't cast so well so cut it to size get it a bit more streamlined and it's lovely now I'm not expecting to catch anything for probably the next half an hour or so at least what's basically going on is we've just hit low tide and I'm waiting for that push of the flood as soon as that starts it'll put some scent in the water off of the bait it'll draw fish in from down tide anyway let's go and chuck this one out there there we go ragworm bait number two I've put an extra worm on the bottom there so I've got two worms on the bottom one on the top the hooks are around a size one which is pretty much perfect for, for sole fishing anyway with a bait like this I'd expect to be leaving out there for about 20 minutes before I consider changing it whereas with the prawn or the crab or the squid you could leave that out for up to an hour depends on conditions on the day if there are a lot of small fish or crabs and stuff like that around that do peck away at baits obviously you need to revise those times a little bit so the tide has started flooding now and this is absolutely key you've got to have that push of water what happens is your baits are sat there in the tide if there's no water pushing past them the scent isn't drifting off downstream it's not going to attract any fish that are in the area when the tide's pushing all of it wafts down almost as if someone was cooking a bacon sarnie upwind of you you'll smell it if there's no wind you won't smell it exactly the same principle okay so the tide is pushing in this could be the key time so this really is the bit now where patience comes into play you've got to be confident in your approach and if you're doing everything right and the fish are out there you've got a fighting chance of catching what you don't want to be doing is being hesitant and thinking mm, i don't know i'll recast that bait you've got to cast out where you think the fish are going to be whether that's 30 yards or 100 yards and if the fish are there you will catch them but like I say patience is something that all anglers have got to learn be confident in what you're doing but then be patient sit on your hands wait for the fish to come along obviously change your baits as and when necessary but focus on the rod tips keep looking up for those bites and don't be thinking about winding your baits in every 10 minutes stick with it be confident Well, as you can see, the tide really is filling up into the bay here now and the wind continues to increase as well. There's a lot of white water out there and it does look very fishy, but I'm actually yet to catch anything at all. What I would say is I did have a cracking bite just now. I was moving both of the rods back on the ratchets. I placed them on the tripod and with that, the right hand one started peeing line off. Well, whatever it was, it soon dropped the bait. I would imagine it was a bass or maybe a smooth hound, and it was on those small hooks. Now, small hooks are great for catching small fish, and there's a lot of truth in what they say about using small hooks to target anything. But I think in this particular case, if that was a bass with a mouth like that, who knows? 
didn't stand much of a chance. But I've still got another hour or so left to go. Let's keep everything crossed. Well, at long last, it does look like I've got a fish on here. There's plenty of weight to it, so I'm guessing it's a ray and it's going to be curled up in the tide. But I'm not complaining. I felt a couple of nods then, but I'm sure it's not a smooth hound here. I'm pretty sure it is a ray. We'll find out in just a second. What have we got? Let's go and have a look. Well, there we go, a little miniature form back ray. Not the uh, most impressive fish, but very beautiful all the same. And you can see that it's taken the top hook of that rig just like that what a lovely little chap let's pop that hook out and go and put her back I reckon well it certainly feels like we've got another ray on here now this is on the two hook clips down rig with size one hooks but I don't expect it's a very big fish. A lot of the form backs this time of year are, are small males. So I'm not too worried if she comes off. Of course, it could be the mother of all soul, but I don't think it is. Or it could be a load of weed as well. There's every chance of it being a load of weed. Flashing her back there anyway. It's got to be a ray, surely. Yeah, it looks like it. See that angry tail flicking around? It's just sat there on the reef at the moment, wait for a wave, and we'll. Uh... Here we go. No. Next one. Go on, pick it up. There she goes. Bang. Oh, I could walk over there, but I'm. I'm feeling lazy, I'm just going to pull her up this gully. There we go. Well, she's not going to break any records, but still, that's quite a weighty little ray. I don't know how big it is, I wouldn't like to say. But a little bit of sport of an afternoon anyway. Well, there we go. He's not going to break any records, but lovely little form back ray, the staple of fishing around these parts. Let's chuck this one back. Well, as you can see by the waves crashing in behind me here, it really is time to get out of here. It's turned into a bit of a rough and nasty old sea out there. The fishing hasn't been great, but the whole point of today was to explain to you guys exactly how I go about things here. We've talked about rods, we've talked about reels, we've talked about rigs, baits, everything else in between. And I hope you can take away some of that information and apply it to your own fishing. Please do note that some of these marks can be dangerous. If you're fishing into the flooding tide, as I've said before, check your exit points. Make sure you're not going to get cut off anywhere. Thanks for watching. Please consider subscribing if you do enjoy this content. It makes a whole load of difference to me and I'll catch you again.